my name is Doug Van Houten, and I live in uh, Goshen, Kentucky, <coughs> which is where Kentucky Fried Chicken comes from. <laughs> Muhammad Ali lives the Kentucky Derby. It's a uh, Midwest state, if you're not familiar with it, south of Chicago, about five hours. And I live out on a farm, a friend's farm, and I feel really blessed. I lived in the city my whole life. And um, I live out on a friend's farm. It's a 2,000-acre farm. And it, it's such a blessing to be. I would never be able to afford it. I live in a house less than what she could charge for it because she's being so generous. Um, but I live on wild land with uh, coyote and deer and owl and uh, skunk and raptors and all kinds of critters in their streams and wild places for me and uh, my family and friends to come out and wander on and be in nature, wild places, which feeds me so much. And the, and the work that I do, we do, is nature-based, real nature-based. And so the, not only the blessing of living on this farm, but I also run programs on this farm in, um, with this kind of work. You know, uh, two-day programs, five-day programs. I'm going to have a 12-day program coming up pretty soon. And then I mentor people one-on-one -on -one in this uh, nature-based soul-guiding work, wild mind healing and holding work. And we'll, we'll say more about that as we go. Um, and I'm wildly passionate about this work. I love sharing this work with people, and I'm just thrilled that this many people came to, to hear this talk. So thank you. That's a little bit about me. And, uh, I live in the southeast of Scotland, in a wee place called Dunbar. And Dunbar is best known for being the birthplace of John Muir, who is the father of the national parks around the world, and uh, so we have a lot of people from around the world to visit his birthplace. And it's an old um, harbour town um, built on rock, and the houses are stone, they're all made of stone. And uh, there are two or harbours, so it's a working harbour, and um, you can walk across the harbour to kind of basalt rocks, and that's where I go to drum in the the full moon or to sing in the sunrise and uh, it's just kind of two minutes from my house but really kind of every house is two minutes from the sea there because it kind of all nestles in on the rocks and that's where John Muir played as a child and where he learned his language and poetry and, um, and I do various work here on programs, I have a, a photograph and poetry exhibition there um, in July that is looking at the shift to um, a human-centric world to a, and to a soul-centric world and also a world that includes earth communities so it's, it really expands our notion of what community is you are probably noticed in maybe this culture as well that it's very human-centered in the way it operates and thinks and acts in the world so uh, my work is also about shifting that wider consciousness to the more earth community and nature based way of living. Can I add a few things I left out? Oh, probably one of the most important. I also guide programs for Animus Valley Institute, which is a nonprofit organization in uh, Colorado, in the States. And we um, run these nature-based programs. It was founded by the fellow that wrote these books up here, a guy named Bill Plotkin. Some of you all might be familiar with him. He's the founder of the Institute. We run 30 or 40 programs all over the globe. And we um, invite people out into wild places to do really deep hard work, to ask the biggest questions of their lives, like what's deeply not working? And what, what's deeply not working? Um, what is it that I'm longing for but not connecting to? Um, uh, we do beautiful uh, wholeness work, cultivating wholeness, what's naturally, innately within us. Um, Alan Malan, 
because the land is the primary teacher in this work. We're, we're just assisting in the work. Because we, we know innately within us what's right for us. And the land helps us to know that and to remember that, really. To trust our own deep knowing. Yeah, and something I'm involved with, AVI, I've uh, been bringing programs over to Europe and making that bridge from America to Europe with this work and um, working towards creating a center for soul centric and uh, nature based work. Um, and one of the other things I've been doing is uh, creating with others, Bogdan's one of the people involved, um, um, an Earth Song Wave event once a year, where on the 1st of April we um, get up around the world and sing for Earth and for the others and work out you know, what is our note, what is the note of humanity at this time um, of this urgent call for us to sing our own notes and to um, uh, explore what that is and what that means and maybe that will make all the difference for each of us to sing our notes. So it's an opportunity to um, sing out and say, yeah, we want to hear the voices of the others. We don't want them to, to go. So um, what we mean when we're speaking of nature-based is that, um, that we are working from the wisdom of the land, from earth. Or we love poetry, so yeah. we'll be whipping out poetry that speaks poetically about mm -hmm. the ideas and uh, concepts that we speak of. The poet, poets yeah. have a beautiful way of speaking to these concepts. Um, so this is a poem from uh, Rilke. Do you, any of you know Rilke? Are you familiar with Rilke? Mm -hmm. German poet. Earth, Earth, isn't this what you want to arise in us, invisible? Is it not your dream to enter us so holy? To enter us so holy, there is nothing left outside us to see. What if not transformation is your deepest purpose? Earth, my love, I want that too, believe me. No more of your spring times are needed to win me over. Even one flower is more than enough. Before I was named, I belonged to you. Before I was named, I belonged to you. I seek no other law but yours, and know I can trust the death you will bring. So here there's something about before I was named, I belong to you. So the sense of our belonging yeah, even before we're born into this world. And, um, yeah, this sense of earth, isn't this what you want to arise in this? That's how would life be if we walked from that experience of who we are as one of earth and be in touch with the, the one that was named. So nature-based work, um, to become fully human is to know our uh, heritage, our place on the earth, to know where we came from, what we arose out of, what we belong to, and it's been spoken many modern Western, maybe the whole planet people have kind of lost connection with the earth. You know, have, I almost have almost no idea about the earth anymore, no intimate contact with it. Um, we're kind of just like tourists through it. It's, and even worse, it's a backdrop and a gravel pit for the larger human affairs, which are considered supreme. You know, <laughs> I'm not saying by any or all of you, maybe partly, I know there's part of me that's still a tourist and uh, a, a rapist of the land in some way, just living in our Western world. Uh, we're destroying the whole planet. All the life, we're shutting all the life systems down. 
and we're 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 on the deck of the Titanic together. You know, and so. So the Titanic, they knew it was going down. Right, <laughs> right. But as there's a sense in many of us that it's going down. And and what do we do? I mean, but even if that wasn't happening, where what would you do? What do you where do you belong? You know, and there's something about uh, reinstalling ourselves on the wild earth that reawakens us at, at uh, unconscious levels, even, but even conscious levels about you know I actually belong from here. I I, I grew up and out of this place. You know, talk about ending some existential angst. You know, there's something about wandering on the earth, naked, or just in your own body, and lying down on the earth, and letting the earth hold you, and maybe you weeping on the earth, or maybe you wandering with great joy, or curiosity, or whatnot. But, but the point is, 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 is belonging to the earth, and re- remembering that. And again, to become fully human, is to awaken again to our place on the earth and how we deeply, profoundly belong. Part of, in Bill, Bill Plotkin's model, his, uh, his idea of, a, of an adult is one who abs- actually deeply feels and knows that they are a member primarily of the earth community, even more so than a human. Primarily a member of the earth community. That's their primary identity. Secondly, one, another one, would be, we'll get into this more too, would be that you've awakened your visionary self. The one who can see. The one, the one who can go out and lament in nature, wander into the secret laboratories of the wild and lament the suffering of your people in your life. Wrestling with your own uh, demons, if you will, perfecting your character, your wholeness, looking at your sub-personalities, having dreams and visions about how to repair the world, coming back to your people with a boon. This is the journey that all the great teeth, like look at Buddha, two years under the tree, he awoke, he awoke in his visionary self, his visionary essence. And then Jesus in the desert, you know, and all these cultures that would send their young ones out into the wild. Go find out why you're here. Culture strays. We get messed up. We wander off into great creativity, but it's not connected to our instinct and to earth. That's why we're, we're destroying everything. So there's no connection. And we've got all these adolescent people running everything. It's worse. They're pathologically adolescent. They're dangerous. We're dangerous to ourselves and to the rest of the Earth community now. <laughs> and so the premise we work at is how to help somebody become fully human again. Nature the, has the primary blueprints for this. Our own deep nature has the primary blueprints. Our own deep knowing soul, deeper layers of our psyche, knows what's right for us. That's the, archi- the true architect. This is what we. This is the currency we work with. The soul is the true architect. You don't have to call it soul. Just your own deep knowing, your gut, your heart, knows what's right. And there's something about getting out on the land that awakens you to that. You can't lie and hide out in the natural world, which is so true to its essence. All of it is. It's so true. You cannot defend yourself in the natural world. Like here, you can get lost in all kinds of insanity and uh, groupthink and addiction and consumerism. And, and it's all gorgeous, too. I mean, you know, it's all gorgeous, too, but it's, it's wandered off and it's, it's, it's destructive. And so, yeah, so in nature, awakening the, the one who can have visions about how to repair the world. And that might sound a little like esoteric or airy fairy or. It's really the heart of what's ever changed anything. It comes from the deep uh, imagination, the deeper layers of our knowing, which our, our surface self is unaware of often. 
So I'll just throw that out for now. Do you want to? Yeah, in that yeah. place in Idle on the Land is where we can voice once again in conversation with the others. And I'm just thinking of uh, autism. And, um, Thomas Berry, one of the fathers of um, this, and, and he speaks of the great. <laughs> I'm trying to think of stuff. Jonathan Macy is the great turning. His is the, the great work. The great work. That's right. Thank you. And he says that we humans have become autistic to the voices of the others. So actually, as humans, we are we have become autistic, and we have closed ourselves off from the great conversation. And in closing ourselves off from the great conversation, we're, we are creating a smaller story about what humanity is. And actually, whilst we're um, killing all the creatures and the extinctions, <coughs> that these beings are always in relation with us. And as they go, we become less human. Because in terms of our conversations on the land, it's these conversations that bring us more to what it means to be human. So what we find when we return on the land and we speak with the beings, with the trees and the flowers and the bees and the clouds and the rivers and the, the stones that all have their language and they're, they're in conversation all the time with their voices. And, and we kind of, we're lost. We're, we're completely autistic. To this, and so, um, and there is something about this language that is so um, innate, but it's like we've forgotten how to connect. So part of our work again is how we connect with our own, um, our own way um, of being with these creatures, and how they are in conversation with us, and how. Um, how I'm noticing even more this week how the land is longing, longing to hear us, is longing to be in the conversation and is maybe dying for our lack of being in conversation and of hearing and of um, our part in recreating, keeping the world. And so that this, uh, I kind of, the word that keeps coming to me these days is holographic reciprocity. This way in which everything is in conversation and song and dance and art and this whole uh, vitality of life. And uh, I'm thinking, uh, Bill Plotkin speaks about depression, how depression is about our really keeping down our, our feelings, many of which are because our life is so small and we're not living the magnificence of who we are. And, uh, and I think for me, depression is a, an appropriate response to the way in which we've shut down our lives and how that also uh, kills life in a bigger sense. We grew up out of the earth. If we have any capacity, it's in the creation from the very beginning. It's always, it's there as well. It may be latent, but think about the, the and this may challenge everything, you, but think about the, the earth, the sun holding the earth. There's a bond there. You know, and, and so it's like the, the mother to the child. There's a bond there. It's, it's in all of creation. This longing and this, this eros, this wanting to be connected to each other. It's in the, it's in the, the sun to the leaf. The leaf longs for the sun ray to come down. I do think we've um, been living in a particular worldview, a particular way um, of experiencing the world and have built a whole way of living around that that then reinforces this particular way of living which then makes that normal and uh, real because it's how we see it. But in fact there is something around, everything around us is alive and animate so that everything um, has its own expression. And it may not be in human language, it may not be in the language you speak or that, that I speak, but it has its own way of um, 
putting its expression in the world and beginning to uh, listen to that with the ears of our head or the ears of our heart or the ears of our feet um, and also expands our uh, experience of what it is to be human. We live in a culture also that kind of lives from here up, so we think about things from here, but we don't think about things from here or from here. Um, and in this model, everything has its own interiority, its own personality, mm-hmm. its own expression, um, and, and, and its own soul, its own place of belonging and being, and its own uh, creativity, its own way of expressing. And so I think as humans, we've sort of separated ourselves. And that's something different over there, and we're separate from it. I'm not sure that's what you mean, but, but it's almost like humans are different than all that. But any, again, back to speak, anything that humans have, in, in my philosophy, my belief, it's in all of creation as well. And mm-hmm. it's a mirror. It's a mirror. There's a mirror. Yeah. Actually, maybe I can share an experience with you. Maybe that will help where I'm coming from. So, uh, in, ninth, in the early 90s, then what it was, I was uh, studying originally one of the things as cultural historian. Um, I was looking at the, uh, the development of the professions of the legal and medical professions and the way in which uh, kind of we were redefining the world in particular ways and the body and particularly the way that I was working in women's bodies, how women's bodies were really redefined during the 19th century along um, uh, the definitions of the medical and legal professions as allies. And in tracking that, um, my original thing was, you know, this is the truth. And by the time I finished my research, it was like, okay, so if that's not the truth, then what is? You know, kind of, who am I? If I'm not this, if I'm not what I've been told, that I have uh, for a lifetime, then who am I? And I, that's when I went wandering. And that's when I started actually living in my imagination. I imagined things. I was walking in the mountains in Scotland, and I started having all these experiences. And that's when I started writing, originally short stories and poetry. So really living into, well, if I'm not that, then who am I? And I started having these experiences that really challenged Mm-hmm. what I thought was real and there was one final one that changed everything and I was walking up in the hills and, um, and just really feeling it completely at one uh, with everything and feeling this total joy in my heart and, and I was speaking to everything as if it were alive and I was speaking out and you know, imagining gnomes and fairies and speaking to the trees and the river and I was literally just feeling in my element. And then I heard singing and I thought, oh, that's gorgeous, this beautiful voice out in the forest and, and then I thought, there's nobody out here. I was curious and I went back. And when I went back, this uh, one tree in the, the woods, and it was November, and there was all the golden needles on the ground. And um, I was kind of listening around until I came, the voice came from this tree, and I thought, this, this cannot be right. There's a tape recorder. Someone has been here earlier and planted a tape recorder. Um, but I was looking around, and I couldn't see a tape recorder anywhere. And then this tree started singing three notes and then leaving a space. And then singing the same three notes and leaving a space. So I, in my joy, just sang the same three notes after this tree, this tree, had sung the three notes. And um, when I finished, this tree sang the three notes and added another three. And I was like, you know, completely blown away by this because it completely shifted everything that I had thought the world was. And the only thing at that point was, well, this doesn't make a riff. It's not making sense. So I thought, okay, I'm going to sing these three notes. And I sang the three notes. And the tree then followed up with another three notes. And I thought, okay, that's it. That's a riff. And when I sang that riff out, no kidding, the whole forest rang out in harmony of that riff. And that's when I just stopped my job, packed everything up, put everything in storage, 
And I thought, you know, I cannot live the way that I was. Now that just changes everything. And that's the song that I'm going to follow. That's the, the thread that I'm picking up because I can't not, you know, I can't pretend that didn't happen. And I can't pretend that something has just been gifted <coughs> for me to um, speak and sing in the world. And, uh, and what I'm hearing is that this has happened to more and more people. And I, think I find it exquisite that the earth is in this place of real crisis and emergency. And one of her responses is to sing to it. Uh, just sing her longing. Okay, and, and I, I just one other piece I want to add is that kind of like what we're presenting kind of goes against everything that we've learned in our mm -hmm. the more of a, the more mechanistic um, w uh, modern worldview of the natural world. Because humans, we have split from nature. You know, as we mentioned earlier, we split, and um, that split was pretty final about the 14th century with the Black Plague all this difficulty coming from nature, it's dangerous and and so we really have, we, we are autistic and that set, has set up all the great difficulties we have and so it is kind of coming back into relationship to it in this way, in, in an intimate way again and I think it's different for different people, the, the experiences that they might have and uh, the uh, visions that they might have, the soul encounters that they might have, the conversations, the things they might hear themselves saying. So many times uh, these conversations are really it's my own knowing that's speaking to me from the depths might not literally be the flower speaking to me. It's like in that conversation with the flower, here's what I hear myself saying from really deep down that this essence that's brought up from my deep essence. You see? And, and if we only have conversations in the city, well, we're going to miss out on all these other conversations, potentials that are out in the wild world. You know, and, and might miss our full humanity. Yeah. Soul, um, I, I, which I think the idea of soul is a very personal uh, Idea. People have different ideas about what that may mean. Certainly, if you talk to like Christians or other, you know, they they have a different way, and, and Jung had a different way, and you know, we probably have slight variations within Bill and each other, and maybe anybody in here. Um, but I'll just tell you, for me, uh, soul is um, how I uniquely embody spirit. How you uniquely embody spirit. What's the spirit? That spirit is the, the, the one that, that uh, you could say guides the whole thing. You may not want to call it spirit. Some people call it God, Yahweh, mystery, whatever that might be. <laughs> but there's the, uh, something uh, is guiding the whole thing, infusing the whole thing, connecting the whole thing. And, and how it, it, it comes through me is unique. That to me is soul. I'm embodying that mystery uniquely, like a thumbprint and a snowflake. No two of us are the same. We have our own unique way of belonging, our own unique expression, our own, our, our own unique niche that we belong in. And so, again, how I embody that is different. How I feel called to embody that, and we, part of what we would say, how, how vision comes, how my own deep knowing tells me about something. You know, it's like, like when I write a song, it's not my intellect writing the song. It's not the thinking part of me that's writing the song. It's the muse. It's, it's soul. It's something deep within me that's writing that, that beautiful song, that melody. I mean, my thinking only tells me what I think. It only knows what I'm thinking. There's other windows of knowing. So there's something else in me writing that song. And so how I express... Uniquely, the, the mystery of all is, is, is my place of belonging, soul, for me. You want to share? Yeah, um, I think um, there are two things I'll share at this point. One is that uh, we're speaking here about offerings. 
So I don't want to sit here and say this is the truth. You know, to do the same as in the sense of where I started off, like believing this is the truth and then finding out that it's not. There's something of this is what I've learned, this is what what has helped me work out and understand the experiences. And this is the way in which I found works for me in relation to what's happening in the world and the great turning and this shift of human consciousness. And please kind of take from this what, what helps you on your way and, and don't feel that um, this is the way to go. But it, for me, it is the, the way that, that I've gone. And also that soul uh, is both of us and more than us. It is about our, our niche in, in nature, in, in earth and in earth community. It's that kind of what we, we are born for and, and from, the name that is given. And quite often in this um, search for our soul and the soul journey, uh, where we give ourselves over, we surrender uh, some sense of who we think we are to that bigger story and to seek that name that we were given, which is usually not the same name that we might be sitting around here with, but it's one that comes from that conversation and, and that longing, and, and that longing to know uh, who we are and the revelation that is gifted us, which is different from a social vocation or a job. Um, but it is, uh, in that sense, we become mature adults when we've received our vision and that we are the only one, that I'm the only person in all time that can bring this vision, this gift to the world like each one of you um, can bring. So where we're going in the world now is not something that we can sit around a table and say, so, okay, so what we need to do is this, 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 and this. And if we just do this and then that. Uh, no, what this, this is saying is that we need to um, surrender uh, to who we thought we uh, think we are in order to go into a deeper and bigger conversation uh, to listen uh, to what Earth is requiring of each one of us and that each one of us doing that will bring in the peace that's needed to move us to the next stage of where we are right now. It makes me think, that, think of the founders of like some of the great uh, religions on earth, and they went through a dramatic transformation. And you could say a death of their old way of being in the world. And through the actual transformation, think caterpillar to butterfly, right? This this is a this is a dying to the adolescent way of being, emerging in the imago self. There's a journey that we all go on. Joseph Campbell wrote the Hero with a Thousand Faces. Every culture talks about this. There's a journey that we go on of dying to our old way of being and, and doing healing and holding work and weeping and lamenting and, and listening and looking off in the future, calling on all the windows of knowing within us, and listening for what's next. So, and it's like listening from within yourself for what's next. Hearing your own self say it. This is, this is it. This is it. We all have these experiences. You just might not call it uh, a soul encounter or a transformation or whatever. But there's an awakening to your own deep inner knowing about something. I mean, I call that soul encounter. There's my own deep knowing about this. And that own deep knowing is, in, is connected to something way bigger than just me and my everyday consciousness. And so we want to tune in. There's something about getting out on the land, too, that tears us down, opens us up to listen for our own deep truth. So we just keep kind of going at this, trying to, because I, I know what we're offering is kind of like, oh, what? Can we just fix the world? What are you getting all this mystical mytho stuff, you know? Just look what fix the world, you know, or whatever it might be. But uh, this is just another way of coming at it. We feel that's really important way of coming at this.
that's, that's sourced in something beyond our strategic minds mm-hmm. and what culture knows. So in Einstein says it's not the same consciousness that's going to uh, change anything. That's the, that same consciousness is just going to cause more trouble often. And so it's like, in, in, in a way, we have all these egos conforming to each other, and culture's getting shallower, shallower, and shallower, and we're destroying more and more, and we're going way off. Yeah. And so how do we root back down into Earth and into our own deep knowing? So this is what we feel is real important work. Healing and holding ourselves, getting our, finding our, our relationship again to the Earth that we live on and the community that we're a part of, and having that kind of eco consciousness world consciousness and our own inner soul consciousness so it's like knowing just more again what my everyday consciousness is that's not going to get us anywhere everyday consciousness so it's opening up to, to, to knowing more about our way forward okay another real key is going to be a real key afternoon how surely gravity's law, strong as an ocean current, takes hold, takes hold of even the smallest thing and pulls it towards the heart of the world. Each thing, each thing, each stone, blossom, child is held in place. Only we in our arrogance push out beyond that we each belong to. For some empty freedom, for some empty freedom. If we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. If we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. Instead, we entangle ourselves in knots of our own making and struggle lonely and confused. So, like children, we begin again to learn from the things, to learn from the things because they are in God's heart. They have never left him. This is what the things can teach us, to fall, patiently to trust our heaviness. Even a bird has to do that before he can fly. So to trust the fall, to trust Earth's intelligence so we can rise up rooted like trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, our own nature awakens when we're in nature. Because mm-hmm. it, op- it opens up another, a deeper conversation, you could say, than the conversation just happening in, in culture. But culture's nature too, though. With bricks and steel and cars and oil and gas and that's all nature too. Mm-hmm. But it's, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a limited conversation. In this work, we want to help people have the largest conversation that you can have with the world, and thus opening you up even to a larger consciousness. Oh, what I do affects seven generations. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, when I pollute and make money over here, it, it's like what's destroying the rainforest over there. You know, it's becoming more than just my local tribe family. Or my own my own egocentric self is by opening up. And nature blows open the doors like nothing else. Mm-hmm. Really, just you cannot defend yourself in the natural world, especially when you're fasting and in solitude. Yeah, as mm-hmm. as Buddha and Jesus did, mm-hmm. and all the thousands and millions of other the, the desert mamas and. The, the indigenous people, the walkabout, you know, all these people before. It's been, this is a pan-cultural thing we're talking about here. This has been going on forever. To find vision, we, to for find renewal. How many people, I'm going to go out into the woods for a week and I'm to find something, to find my pieces. It's like it's one of those great places that we find renewal and vision. Not, but you can have vision in the city too. You might have a vision right here. You know, but there's something about opening up the conversation to even bigger than mm-hmm. just this that opens up the possibility of what can emerge from your own depths. So, is there another question? Here? Yes. A um, couple of things come up with that. Happiness is great. I want to be happy, but perhaps even more important, I want meaning. 
in my life. Maybe equally as to happiness. And, and meaning for me comes in, in uh, the, the, the myths that I'm telling myself, the stories that I'm telling myself. I get myths or, or meaning from that. So how I see the world and the kind of experiences I have opened up that possibility of, of me finding meaning. But I think happiness also for me is a kind of like wholeness, like the quality of wholeness, um, in which may be a little different what you, than what you're asking. But we also do this incredible healing and holding, this wild mind work that we do. It's simple you know, what we do. This is the program we just had a seven day. These folks in this back row over here, these five here. Um, folks, and so, yeah, over here, um, back there, and, you know, yeah, on this one. Uh, we do uh, uh, help people to cultivate their wholeness, guide them in that, assist nature in that, and to delve into their fragmentation, their subpersonalities, the immature parts in them. And so the, the premise that we work, the deep premise is that. Uh, our nature is a total, absolute mirror of nature. The, the motifs and patterns happening out in the world are in our own psyche. Creativity, imagination, memory, emotion, this arose out of the natural world that we grew evolved over millions of years with and from. And, and again, back to that piece about when we go out on the land, uh, we can learn a great deal about like one of the facets of wholeness is the nurturing one of us in this model, the nurturing adult in us. We can learn a lot about going out on the land and noticing how nature nur- n- nurtures itself and each other. Mother bear to the cub, the sun hitting the, 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 the grass, the water feeding the plants, you know, and then we could lie on the earth and feel into that support. Literally everything about us comes from the sun eight minutes ago, feeding anything and everything we eat, the water we drink, everything in our, again, in fact, everything about our imagination, our feeling senses, it evolved out of this world that we live in. And so again, when we reinstall ourselves out there, we'll learn something profound about our own nature. It'll blow the doors open. And we'll have these these experiences that, that our rational mind cannot grasp. And our rational minds don't like on some level. But I can't I can't I can't weigh that. I can't compute that. It's not the model that I've been taught. It doesn't fit into this modern worldview. We can't weigh it. You can't uh, package it, you can't sell it. I'm exaggerating then it's not real. It's, it's this, this other weird thing over there. Um, yeah. Can I speak to that as well? Mm-hmm. There's, there's something about one of the things that I've learned is that happiness is really overrated. Um, there's only one aspect of all the many dimensions of what it is to be human. And in a culture such as ours, a particular way of thinking of what happiness is leads us really down the road. My experience. And um, one of the things I've found that's helped me in this work is this sense of um, how I can cultivate so many aspects and facets of who I am so that my capacity to hold pain, my capacity to be with the, the grief that I feel about this world that moves me in a particular way to be in it, the capacity to be able to be alongside someone um, wherever they are, um, and particularly this culture that really represses all aspects of other kinds of feelings and will want us to be happy in a particular way in order to market a particular product that usually will take something from the earth killing the earth in order to make it. So for me, it's about how do I follow what my soul's longing is? And that may take me into deeply uncomfortable places. And to do that, to be able to cultivate all the things that I need to be able to take me to where I need to go and to be who 
um, that image is calling me to be um, to be the peace that only I can be uh, in this time in the world that is calling <coughs> us to, to be that uh, which may likely to be completely different to uh, where I am um, so for me it's about cultivating much more about what it is to be human so for me the happiness is really overrated should we open the questions yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you because you speak a lot about soul I want to ask you what do you believe about death I mean what happens with the soul after you die and I don't know because I'm telling this because I, I've lost someone very loved by me recently mm -hmm. and somehow I feel um, her presence always with me and I really want to know what is your opinion about death and what is happening with the soul after this because with the body we don't know what is happening but with the soul there is no explanation about this and I want to know your opinion for me, it's pretty short. I, I don't know what happens after we die. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a total mystery. And, and I haven't had any experiences that um, to, to speak to that. So I, I, I couldn't speak to that. Maybe you've had different experiences about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I kind of have some thoughts and feelings, but not really in a way that I could articulate. Mm -hmm. At this point, that may kind of, and it sounds like maybe you're um, uh, wondering in terms of your own longing, maybe, or your own explorations, or your own wonderings. And I, I um, might invite you to really um, allow the question in you and let that work you. And, and sometimes I think you know, death is the biggest mystery that we're all heading for at, at some point. And um, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious about it. Um, uh, sometimes I feel I get little glimpses. Sometimes I feel the grief. Um, so I'm, I don't want, yeah, it's not a question I feel I have the expertise yeah, in yeah, yeah, to yeah. answer. I have a question, mm -hmm. and uh, my question is, what might be some of the obstacles and challenges in following the soul? Oh, yeah, that's kind of a question. A couple of questions over here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The challenges. Obstacles. Yeah. What maybe can make it difficult to jump follow the soul uh -huh. and the soul journey? Yeah. They go against everything you've trained and prepared for in life. There's part of you might just come up and, you know, maybe it's part of you, we've actually been here and talking to you for a long time too. But at some point it's like, yeah, this deep knowing in you, it's like, yeah, here's what your life's really about. This is it. This is where the juice is. And, um, there may be a lot of grief in that, you know, about uh, beauty too. It's like, oh wow, you have rev revelation here. I, I got this mission or, or whatever it might be, you know, this insight. Um, but it could be very challenging what that uh, opening asks of you. Um, I know for me, it's been it's been challenging to follow um, this work that I'm doing now. It's like I walked away from 401ks you know, retirement funds and huge salary and, um, uh, you know, kind of stature in, in the culture and the way people experienced it and knew me. And some people thought, it, you know, lost my mind in a way. You know, he's too spiritual now, he's too this and whatever. But I'm on, I feel like I'm on fire now with the, with the central conversations of my life now and, and, and going at it. And, um, and, and it's terrifying, too, at times, because it asks me to stay in this place of, of uh, vulnerability, of like how the world sees me, um, how I'm going to pay the bills, um, you know, 
um, how I belong and, and where am I going to do that? You, you know, it's just it brings up all these issues for a person. Yet I feel really, I feel just absolutely compelled to stay true to the uh, uh, what's really calling. It really brings me alive, and it's not something that generally the culture would really value. Most people kind of look at like all my old friends and look kind of look at what I'm doing, and they're like. What's the best stuff you do? You take people out in the woods and do you howl at the moon? Is that it? You know, it's like they're, they, they, sometimes they discount it or some people slightly get it. But like even my sister, here's 12 years later, I've been going at this and she still can't even tell anybody. Like people, friends say, well, how's your brother? And she's like, yeah, he's doing something. I'm not really quite sure what it is. <laughs> you know. Um, so it is. it can be very challenging. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there may not be cultural support for it. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at this question is I'm just going to kind of mix two of Bill's books. And this one is um, a real visionary, uh, I think, visionary way, a uh, visionary model of um, soul centric human development. And um, in this book, he speaks of eight stages of human development. And um, in the first stages, we're kind of developing a healthy ego in relation with our culture. So we find a place in our culture. We have a kind of sense of an um, identity. Maybe at some point, becomes more authentic. So we become more authentic as well as um, accepted in the culture. Um, things which in our culture are very difficult to do. Um, but at some point, we need to, uh, or mystery, comes in that we need to shift into a different part, and this is what you were speaking earlier about the, where we're being called into a deeper life and into deeper questions in our life, and we need to kind of shift like from the caterpillar into the cocoon of human development. And what happens at that point is that the ego development that we've created is really going to kick and do everything that it can because it's experiencing this as a death. And so these parts are going to be activated and they're going to come in and they're going to be doing what they can to protect us as they see the <laughs> death that's coming our way or the changes that are coming our way. So we might have aspects that then go to, to the well mind model um, where we've created uh, the victims or the uh, loyal soldiers, those parts of us that are really protecting. And they are going to be first perceived and experienced as ob obstacles. Um, but in fact, they'll also hold real gems and treasures for us. But at first, they will be experienced as obstacles on the, the journey. And um, yeah, because they don't want us to change. That's where I was headed to. I'd love to jump into because another obstacle from for, from living from what we really long for. I mean, another way I feel soul about soul is what I really long for. Exactly. And um, but what can all what can stand in the way are uh, our wounded parts, our hurt parts, are what we call our sub personalities. And these are the places that we've been hurt, crushed, uh, traumatized, rejected, abandoned, etc. And if you have those parts, they're often on autopilot, running their strategies to protect us or keep us safe, and they could um, sabotage uh, you from living a full life or risking your significance or for saying yes to a larger vision or to what you really want to do as opposed to doing what I think I ought to do and doing it from a wounded place. So there's something real important about cultivating wholeness and, and delving into the parts of us that um, need some loving and some healing. It's huge work. We're caked over with addiction stuff. Most of us in the modern Western world screens, spending hours on screens, playing games and uh, pornography and all kinds of stuff. Addiction, drinking, escapist, uh, on and on and on, drinking, smoking and uh, food, relationships, con massive consumerism, you know, and then there's the parts that have been hurt by families, caregivers, relationships, uh, religious, it's 
etc., etc. Our families, our peer groups that have been hurt. Um, then there's like our own inner harsh critic <clears throat> or inner flatterer. You know. And then there's all the other things that we don't know about ourselves that are in, that's in the shadow. But they're true, about, they're true about us. But the conscious part of us doesn't know. So where I'm going with that and what was offered is that we, we do, it, like I said earlier, some really incredible healing and holing work with people. Self-healing and holing work with people. It's, it's actually quite profound on the land. Yeah. And that's this past week was mainly about mm-hmm. that, that we had several people at this program. <laughs> and it's life-changing. To, uh, to know the parts of you that are grabbing the microphone on autopilot running the show. And to heal those parts of ourselves. Because if we don't do that, it's hard to, to follow a vision or to manifest what we feel called to do in the world. Well, that, this whole book, this is a great book if you haven't read it. This is all about the wild mind work we do around self healing and holding. Na- na- the nature based work. Lots of great stuff in here, practices and processes to do that. Yeah. You know, and, and Jung said it's a lifelong work. Our wholeness is a lifelong work, and it's something that we're always uh, privileged to work on as humans. And we should never stop. But uh, it's like, kind of like not part of our, our, our modern view. We should have a carefree life of goods and services. and freedom and, and luxury items and goods. I'm being a little sarcastic here, exaggerating a little yeah. bit, but... The earth is for tourism and that kind of Yeah, thing. yeah. But it, but it takes effort to cultivate our wholeness, real effort. And, and it's a practice. You set up practices for doing this, and, and that's kind of the work that we do. We offer these uh, processes, practices for people. Yeah. I'm curious what sort of practices... Yeah. Uh, like, like I sort of offered one a moment ago about uh, wandering on the earth, uh, reinstalling uh, myself, you could say, um, and uh, letting the earth hold and nurture me. Oh, and uh, thus awakening what that feels like on a profound level to actually belong here on this planet and grew up out of here. It's very a very nurturing thing. The other thing could be like. What do you really need to do to take care of yourself? You know, what's your daily practices around that? Um, you know, eating well. You know, emotional uh, vocabulary and literacy. Right, doing self-healing work. Maybe there's yoga practices, exercise. You know, emotional, spiritual, physical practices to help with that. Maybe go kind of on a wandering in wild places is a profound experience in holy ourselves, working on the wild indigenous one in us who is fully at home in the wild world and in our bodies, uh, and with sensuality and, and eroticism, uh, the one in us who knows our indigenosity, where we belong on the earth, you know, the bioregion we're from, whose scat that is, whose call is that? In a way, leaving, right? In a way, what? Leaving. Leaving. Leaving, right? Oh, living life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I happen if during the day you spent some time um, imagining into the animate world. What if when you were listening to the bird song, you walk this beautiful park that you have that's just greening up. And what if you imagine those trees are animate, uh, not just kind of these stationary objects that and have beauty and so forth, mm-hmm. but actually your expression, and you could have a conversation with them. I mean, it's just the fly is still with them. <laughs> <laughs> what if you began to have an awareness of, you know, watching these beings and being aware of them? We help people do that. We do what we call mentoring, and it, in my mind, it's a kind of, of uh, coaching in a way, mm-hmm. helping people cultivate wholeness and, to, again, to delve into the fragmented parts of themselves and, and to know what's underneath that. When did this happen? Uh, what's the voice? How to, how to be present with that, with my wholeness, and have compassion for myself when that part flares up, and love that one. And help to self, 
do self-healing around that as well. Profound work. We again, we live in a in a, a culture that's pretty wounded, and we're wounding each other constantly all over the globe, wounding the world. Um, so there's a lot of, of healing and self-healing and pulling work that's uh, critical for our own personal well-being and sanity, quite frankly. Um, but, it, but it's also kind of like, as I do that, uh, as I do my own healing and whole self-healing holding work, then I'm not uh, out there harming others as much. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So there's... Go, go ahead. Then there was another question. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, as you were speaking tonight, coming back to your question in terms of being a teacher and uh, with school children yeah. and, and this sense that in our culture, our education system is really... Um, interested in uh, teaching people how to be in a workforce in a particular culture. Um, so for you, I was just thinking of that book, I was thinking when I picked it up, this Nature and the Human Soul about human development, because this one um, gives a very different model around uh, our stages of human development and how every stage on this wheel has some um, offerings for our uh, healthy culture and how we can cultivate um, specific things at that time um, in order to create a healthy culture. Um, yeah, that sounds like a very modern industrial culture need that we have to be successful and effective and it's using a particular way or a particular um, um, organizational way and it may be that at some point and um, in the nature of the human soul it, there's, there's um, kind of three stages that, that go up to um, a healthy adolescence there's a healthy adolescence which in a healthy culture would be um, eco uh, centered and our culture is a patho adolescence we're not in eco um, healthy adolescence yet but at, at that point it's actually mystery that pulls us in to the next point of um, human development and our culture in a healthy culture elders might be looking out for particular questions so thinking oh well, this person is asking questions about um, uh, mystery so they're asking questions about sexuality or they're asking questions about, well, what is my meaning? And, um, well, is this all there is? Is there, is there more of it to life than this? And, and uh, elders looking would, would then start pulling people out. Okay, so these, these people are beginning to ask deeper questions. And that's when we um, give ourselves much o- o- more openly surrendering to this. Uh, what's called the wanderer and the cocoon where we're really wandering and we're wondering and we're deepening in and um, letting go and learning about the, the facets of fragments that we need to let go of and to go down into Mystery Canyon and maybe you want to speak of Mystery Canyon. Well, in, in, the, in, for, in, our, in this model there's a period of wandering in the unknown. You could say Bill has a great archetype on here. That there's this part of us that knows there's more to life than this. And um, needs to spend some time in that not knowing place. Just like in the cocoon, the butterfly is, is, is boiling down into a soup. And, and, then, and then physicists call it the imaginal buzz. Scientists that call it the imaginal buds come on the scene that that facilitate the arrival of the butterfly. Old parts of the caterpillar attack those imaginal buds too because they're kind of holding on to the old way of being. But these imaginal buds bring on the butterfly, this new way of being in the world. The Greeks knew that the Greeks had psyche, soul, and butterfly the same word for all three. They knew there was some kind of transformation that was required to meet adult, to reach adulthood. And so there is a period of wandering in the not known, and it's in that place of, of again, I, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but it's like Jesus wandering in the desert, 
for five years. I would say not 40 days, for, for five years, wrestling with his demons, perfecting his character, lamenting the suffering of his people, having dreams and visions about how to repair the world. And he came back to his people with a boon, his full voice. He went at it. Buddha did the same thing, and it was so. These experiences are so profound and universal, quite frankly. But and and we've only we've we've narrowed it down. We've devolved psycho spiritually. We've only narrowed. Oh, just those people, those special people right there. Nature-based people knew it was everybody's journey, and everybody's right to uh, go on this journey of of uh, finding their imago version of themselves. And that means, in, in a sense, experiencing ourselves in, in a different consciousness than we might have in the day world. And I think young people, um, particularly, who are ready for this journey to go into that unknown, to go into that place where our human consciousness shifts in relation to ourselves and another, and many of the addictions and the kind of alcohol and drugs and things a real call to something that is their true inheritance about what it is to be human and to experience themselves, yourselves, as something more than we might see in the world around us in the human world. There's some part of our young people that really know that there's only particular channels in which we can offer them in our own patho adolescent <laughs> yeah, animus is not the only, the only place to do this. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have explicit animus. In fact, any, any, you Maybe can have these experiences way. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Way we, we help people do what we call the voluntary descent yeah. to soul. But you need yeah. nature. I think that's, that's something or your that own from yeah. all the yeah. other strategies that you have in psychology and yeah. Uh, yeah, they, I think that nature is part of it. Finding our our full place of belonging in the in the in the larger, because we're more than just uh, this one nation or this one community. Or we're more than just this nation. We're more than we're, we're we are members of this larger Earth community, and that's the kind of consciousness we need now. That should be our primary identity. Like Alan yeah. says that uh, the earth peoples just like an apple creates apples. So we are yeah. just emerging. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. why we are all connected. Yeah. 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 It's been said that we are at that stage where humanity is actually at a, cr a crisis point in which we're going into the soup and are we going to emerge as a humanity? Mm -hmm. Some people say we're not actually humanity, but we're not. It feels like to me we're on a, on a planetary vision quest. <laughs> and, and there's a kind of dying going on right now. And it's like in the uh, cocoon, it's a very uncomfortable place that's happening. And I, you know, I just saw Philip, my heart wants to say too that um, as young people facing what's coming down the pike, mm -hmm. I feel like there's this bottleneck coming. Everything's coming together, you know, all these crises are coming down, barreling down, and, and uh, i got to say, I feel for you, profoundly, and I mean that sincerely, I don't, I'm not being flippant, I feel for you, what's coming and what's, what is, uh, 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 what the future may hold, and is holding, I mean, things are unraveling all around us, yeah. Yeah, the, the inheritance that my generation and the generation before me have left for the young ones is mm -hmm. horrendous. It's horrendous, horrendous. And the other thing I'm finding is that young people I'm working with, I'm astonished by. And I think I heard um, Bill Hawkins saying as well, once at the, his work he's doing with young people, it's like Earth is birthing what the world needs. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, the young people, their consciousness is like, oh my, like this is amazing. And uh, I find it uh, astonishing, really astonishing. So I also wonder you know, what, what Earth is cooking up in this. Yeah. And, and, and through your vision, 
of what's possible and what's next. Yeah. So let's try to imagine a world where most of the people would live according to a soul centric kind of uh, life. How would social structures look like? Families or communities? And how would the economy look like? Good question. Yeah. Well, my, my sense again is that we don't know until you get your visions, until you move into that place, because it's not something we can sit around a table and work out. Uh, that's literally what each one of us are here for to uh, wonder about well, what is my peace in? what that might be. And I think uh, Thomas Berry spoke to this about how um, the nature-based cultures that have been mainly destroyed by modern human industrial society um, uh, can give guidance in that sense. But he said we've destroyed them so much that you know, they're not there anymore. Um, so there's something about really paying attention, and maybe this might be my last thing, to really pay attention to what is your conversation, what is your unique conversation that if you don't speak will never ever be in this world, and uh, to, that it matters that your conversation with uh, the, the land and, um, and with your soul, to bring your soul in. Uh, really matters and maybe there's something in your soul around uh, bringing a different kind of family or uh, structures or ways in that might be part of what your soul is speaking to you about uh, what your work may be um, it's so uh, important and it, it seriously matters and you seriously matter mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I also want to say that I have felt, um, I know this is really cliche, but I do feel deeply touched that you've invited us and that you've come here and listened and, and been in conversation. And I send deep blessings to all of you on, on your, your journeys. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think I'll, I'd love like to read a poem, sure. yeah. and, and to, for me it's like nothing happens that isn't drunk first. Yeah. And, and so what, uh, what uh, are you dreaming up is the way forward. Yeah. And I read this poem uh, in a program, this is a, that's by, by Drew Dellinger, mm -hmm. any of you know him? It's a hieroglyphic stairway. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something. When the season started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying, did you fill the streets with protests when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? I'm riding home on the Colma train. I've got the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I have teams of scientists feeding me data daily and pleading I immediately turn it into poetry. I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. I am the desirous earth equidistant to the underworld and the flesh of the stars. I am everywhere already lost. The moments the universe turns transparent and all the light shoots through the cosmos. I use words to instigate silence. I'm a hieroglyphic stairway in a buried Mayan city, suddenly exposed by a hurricane. A satellite circling Earth finding dinosaur bones in the Gobi Desert. I am telescopes that see back in time. I am the procession of the equinoxes. The magnetism of the spiraling sea. 
I'm riding home on the Colma train with the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I am myths where violets blossom from blood like dying and rising gods. I am the boundary of time, soul encountering soul, and tongues of fire. <coughs> It's 3.23 in the morning, and I can't sleep because my great-great-children, grandchildren, ask me in my dreams, what did you do while the earth was unraveling? I have just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. He's a rap artist. He does that best with the rap. I don't quite know. <laughs> He's bad, but you can check this out on yeah. YouTube. He, he does this stunning. Yeah. So, it's such a beautiful book. Uh, love letters to the Milky Way. <laughs> so we thank you all. Um, thank you.